All right. Hey, actually, I forgot to turn or remember to turn the tel uh, microphone on right at the beginning today, which is kind of the least of our issues so far. The uh, web browser has crashed twice, and we're going to see what else goes on. But today is Friday, and this is our fifth in a row COPD Navigator house call. My name is Mike Hess. I am a respiratory therapist and COPD Navigator. I run a Facebook group called COPD Navigator, uh, in which we have a lot of people living with COPD, their family, friends, caregivers. We've got a lot of clinicians in there. We've got everybody, lots of different people with uh, interests in the COPD community and uh, the goings on in the COPD world. So, uh, and then every two weeks on Wednesday, here's, yeah, every, every other Wednesday, uh, do a live show uh, traditionally uh, on a topic of particular topic where we do a lot of teaching and answer a lot of questions and all that sort of thing. But with the current uh, travel slash stay at home situation being what it is, and now uh, recommendations coming down even uh, um, nothing formal yet, but recommendations at the national level that everybody should just kind of hunker down for a little while and do this uh, distancing, do all of our socializing uh, over the internet or other conferencing solutions. Uh, I want to make sure that people are still getting or still having access to the information they need that they would normally get through perhaps a pulmonary rehab or their um, their provider's office that may be a little bit less accessible these days. Uh, this is, of course, not medical advice. Um, can't do that over the Internet. Can't give you exact answers on your case. But what we can do is tell you what the best practice recommendations might be for you to take back to your clinical team and figure out what is the best solution for you. So uh, let's see, what are we going to do when we get started here? First off, uh, like I said, I'm going to invite everybody to uh, drop your questions into the comment box. This is kind of a free form show this week, uh, making sure that uh, everybody just has a, a place to ask their questions or to share a story, something that uh, fun slash interesting that's happened to you. Uh, during the uh, quote-unquote quarantine situation. Uh, I'm just trying to uh, have a good place to get together uh, safely without exposing anybody to any untoward viruses or anything of that nature. Um, also today, celebrating the release of a new video that I have uh, put together. Um, I've done, uh, this is the second one I've done uh, this time around or this this year I used to do them I uh, did a couple of them uh, a couple of years in a row for respiratory care week but um, now with uh, a respiratory condition a respiratory disease in the spotlight these days of course a lot more people than usual are asking who are these respiratory therapy people what is a respiratory therapist uh, and so on and so forth so I did one a couple weeks ago that was a little bit uh, more high intensity uh, this one uh, as you can see in the uh, the link down here um, just uh, just uh, fired off, I'm going to figure out how to work the fingers here, just figured off uh, on YouTube or figured out, yeah, fired off on YouTube um, a little bit before we went live today, right before all the tech issues hit. So check that out. Let me know what you think. Um, I'm pretty proud of it, as you might, uh, might expect, but I am kind of biased. So a uh, big shout out to Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, who uh, did a fantastic rendition of one of my favorite Foo Fighters songs, My Hero, which is appropriate for a lot of people living in the COPD world, uh, be it somebody living with COPD or my respiratory therapy friends or, of course, the other um, health professionals that take care of that. Um, this week, uh, we also saw uh, National Doctors Day. I believe that was Wednesday, so that was a, a great time to recognize a lot of our um, MDs and DOs out there. Uh, also like to recognize our nursing staff, our housekeeping staff, uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists, social work. Um, too many, too many people, too many disciplines to really know, but everybody is really coming together um, and uh, fighting to keep a lot of people um, going. Um, so, like I said, we're going to try and keep things light, keep things positive this week. Um, there's always a lot of bad news, and of course, there's some bad news with our with our you know respiratory realms this week too. But we're going to try and keep it light. Um, so make sure you're getting those questions in there. One thing I do want to highlight, um, I did come across earlier today. I'm going to see if I can bring up the study again because I want to talk about it a little bit more in detail. Um, in my Twitter feed today, there was a new study that was published. Uh, actually, one of the few things that's kind of going on right now. 
Uh, that's given me some hassle on Twitter. So let's see. I guess uh, we'll. Um, well, I have a handy dandy tablet here, and I know that was working before. So bear with me just a second. This was a an actually a study that came out specific to COPD. Like I said, we've been kind of struggling all week. We haven't really seen a lot in the way of studies out there right now as you might expect we have a lot of people who uh, a lot of these things are on hold right now because you can't um, can't have much face-to-face -face contact so it's hard to have some of these uh, follow-ups and things like that so uh, if you follow me over on uh, on twitter which we've got the um we've got the address up here uh, at copd navigator that is one that I retweeted earlier. Um, let's see if I can find. Here we go. So what this study does looks like it came out of Australia, if I'm not mistaken, published in a journal called Nature. Peer-reviewed, pretty solid. Um, you know, figuring out the best way to deliver COPD care is always tricky. We see a lot of, there's a lot of conflicting information. Uh, and again, I apologize for touching my face. You never know how much you touch your face until you have the restriction to not touch your face. But I did wash my hands before I came down here. Still haven't gotten that hand sanitizer uh, stationed down here, but I'm going to put that on the list for the shows next week. Um, so, there's a lot of conflicting reports out there about how do we take care for our COPD community the best. Um, there have been a couple of times where um, we get uh, what, what seems to be conflicting information. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. We get some reports where if we teach people how to manage their symptoms better, sometimes their outcomes are actually worse. Uh, there was a famous slash infamous study that came out of the Department of Veterans Affairs where they were doing uh, telephone-based interventions, uh, telephone-based teaching, and all that sort of stuff. And they actually had to stop the uh, study early because too many people were passing away in the intervention group compared to the control group. So it seemed like the more we taught um, people about COPD, the faster they died, which didn't really make a lot of sense. So we see a lot of these, um, a lot of these issues coming around. We don't really know what to do. And so this, this group looked at um, what's called patient activation, which is kind of a, a, an interesting concept as far as, I want to see if I can find how they precisely uh, um, describe it. There's a way you can, it's basically um, activation. Uh, I just want to see exactly how they describe it because I have my thoughts on activation and all that kind of stuff. But uh, um, basically what we're talking about is taking a more um, hands-on approach. You're, you're more engaged in your own care if you're activated, essentially is what that boils down to. So um, they looked at that. They looked at... Um, what else they look at? Uh, they did look at uh, uh, morbidity, um, which is um, how uh, kind of some quality of life measures, how other processes can affect your, your condition and your symptom burden and all that stuff. Um, and specific to quality of life, they also looked at um, knowledge about COPD, which is one of those things that we try and work on a lot with these programs. Um, and they talked about inhaler device technique, which is, of course, uh, one of my huge areas of focus, making sure that you know how to use the devices correctly. And what they found was simply by developing an educational program um, that did address some of these multi-morbidities or what we would call uh, conditions that you have with COPD, oftentimes diabetes or heart problems, things like that, um, what they found, they did, this was a group that was had spirometry diagnosed COPD, was aged 40 to 84. They found that there were, uh, within six months, there were significant improvements in that patient activation, so people were more engaged in their own care. Uh, their COPD-related quality of life, so generally speaking, we're talking about less coughing, less shortness of breath, that sort of thing. Uh, better COPD knowledge and better um, inhaler device technique. So... Um, this study, what they did, and again, this was over, um, six months. So what they did, uh, it was a relatively, well, I shouldn't say a relatively small study. They had 61 practices. 
uh, that were invited. And it was only about 50 uh, participants because um, they had a lot of people that did, never responded to the survey or anything like that. Of those 50, 44 made it through all six months without falling off. Um, so uh, what did they actually do? Um, this was through primary care, which really caught my eye because that is I'm one of the oddball RTs out there that actually does work through primary care, um, which is kind of cool. So we had uh, three sessions, it looks like, where they taught people how to uh, you know do these things. They, they taught knowledge about COPD, kind of some of the, the, um, the schoolish parts of pulmonary rehab, the non-exercise parts. Um, how often were the sessions? Um, Sometimes these studies are not quite published in the order you'd like to see them published in. So let's see, we had uh, there's recruitment, intervention. So we got intervention. We had nurses um, that were, we had um, primary care nurses that were taught in uh, one-day workshops that were uh, facilitated by the authors of this study, trained to do a particular part of, uh, or a particular information, and like kind of design their own program using a template uh, based on what's called the health belief model that helps you identify priorities and goals and stuff like that. Um, so we had three face-to-face -face sessions spaced two weeks apart. So uh, one session, one session, one session, and then uh, monthly follow-up phone calls for five months. So that's where we got that six-month time frame where we made sure that the 50-odd the people made it that whole way through. Um, so, uh, and as John is pointing out here in the, uh, on the, in the watch party, thank you for joining in, John, uh, Anthem healthcare just posted a lot of jobs for respiratory therapists to be health coaches, good position for patient education. So, uh, any of my RT friends out there who aren't otherwise occupied or who are looking ahead, um, toward the end of our current crisis situation, um, you know, we're going to have a lot of need for this going on. Oh, we've talked all week about how, this current uh, this current pandemic crisis is kind of illustrating a lot of gaps in our healthcare system that aren't going to go away when the, this uh, this particular coronavirus does. We still need you know COPD is still happening, asthma is still happening, all these things are still going on. We're still going to need people to we're going to need clinicians to teach people how best to manage their conditions and how to keep themselves at lower risk for uh, during future pandemics. So. Um, that would be a great position. I encourage anybody I know that's uh, especially right now, not necessarily the, the sexiest thing in the world to be looking at uh, um, disease management and stuff instead of working on ventilators and, and doing the intensive care stuff. But uh, personally speaking, I know that has been a tremendous benefit for me and uh, it's been a very fulfilling task. So thank you, John Hannigan, for pointing that out. And I encourage any of my RT friends out there um, to take a look at that once uh, once you have some more free time again, uh, which hopefully won't be too much longer. So still waiting on some questions today. Uh, you can join us on YouTube. You can join us on Facebook. Um, I'm going to, let's see, we're going to um, take a spin through, see if there's any other news out there. Not seeing, uh, uh, let's see, somebody's got to have some questions out there, but while... We're waiting on that. Or if you want to drop some more information like um, uh, my friend John, fellow therapist, did, uh, that would be great, too. Let's share some stories. I mean, this doesn't have to be all clinical news all the time. Part of what we want to do here is um, share good news, share stories, share things you've learned, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I've been trying to make an effort to do a different respiratory shirt each day of the week. Today's shirt brought to you by my friend uh, Sam Hall, who I've mentioned a couple times this week. He's a sarcoidosis guy. This is Sarcoidosis Awareness Month. He's also an inventor, uh, created the, uh, along with his partner, created um, safety or the O2 safety strap. Uh, so if anybody out there is on some home oxygen uh, and finds yourself at risk for tripping and all that stuff, you can go to O2SafetyStrap.com, get some more information about that and support a small business and uh, our, our COPD community thing at the same time during this uh this is a tough time for a lot of small businesses out there, so I encourage everybody to check that out there. Thoughts on masks. John Linnell, another fantastic advocate. Thanks for coming in, uh, John. 
Uh, thoughts on masks, simple cotton, vacuum cleaner bags. What is actually going to work versus just look safe? Um, that's an interesting question because there's we've, we've talked about this a little bit with gloves and things like that. And of course, the guidance is changing all the time. Um, my concern with things like cotton masks and things like that, I'm concerned that they often lead to a false sense of security. You know, we've talked, we, we tend to forget to focus on the fine details of certain things. Like uh, the example I've used a couple of times is we talk about doing spirometry. We don't talk about doing high quality spirometry, even though spirometry is one of those things that's kind of garbage in, garbage out. We want to make sure we're getting good information. Uh, masks can be helpful if they're used properly, if they're taken on and taken off properly, if they're made out of the right materials. Um, it's again, also kind of one of those things we've taken for granted. So we don't necessarily have a lot of solid evidence. There has been a study that tells us that um, simple cotton masks and things like that actually can make things worse because they get damp, they get moist, and then bacteria grows in there. And then you can, you, it, you may not necessarily get whatever you're intentionally uh, um, trying to block out, but you may get something else instead, and that may end up being worse. Uh, you know, a lot of folks with COPD often have bacteria just in there all the time, and if you bring in a new strain, then it can cause a whole bunch of other problems. So I would be reluctant to go with a cotton mask. I know uh, a cotton mask alone, I'll say that. There, there has been some thought that if you're wearing a surgical mask or an N95 and you have the, uh, particularly a surgical mask, because I'm still not, uh, I know it's easy to say, but I, I don't like the re idea of reusing N95s. Um, if you have a cotton mask over a surgical mask, that can be effective um, in keeping your mask safe a little bit longer. But I would not, I would hesitate to use one just by itself, a cotton mask just by itself. Um, and it, it, it's a quandary because we also know that in, uh, particularly in Asia, where a lot of the, a lot of folks are used to wearing masks in public, it's a little bit more socially accepted and that sort of thing. They seem to have some slower rates of infection. And so there's a lot of thought that, I'll back up for a second. When you're wearing a surgical mask, it keeps the stuff in. Um, so that's why, you know, they say if, you, if you're sick and you go to the doctor's office, you should wear a mask because if you were to cough or sneeze or something like that, it helps keep that stuff in. It doesn't really prevent what's out from getting into you. So if you are sick, you'll prevent, you'll stop from getting everybody else sick, but it, they don't necessarily protect against you getting sick because they're bad. They're, they don't seal real well around the chin most of the time. They don't seal. You, most people don't necessarily wear them properly. Um, so it, they, it can stop the spread by stopping people who may be even asymptomatic, not have symptoms or anything like that, it may help them from generating the spread. Um, and there's some thought about how you should you should act like you're already infected and you're trying to prevent other people from getting infected, in which case that would say wear a surgical mask or, or something to that effect. Um, vacuum cleaner bag, probably less effective unless it's a really probably a costly one that has the, the uh, HEPA filtration, um, which is probably, again, a little bit overboard. Um, Best things are still kind of washing your hands, avoiding sick people whenever possible. I'm just not a, f a big fan of the masks in general because uh, by and large, most people don't wear them correctly. Um, and the, the ones that are kind of improvised aren't going to be super great anyway and might give you that, that false sense of security. If you happen to have access to a surgical mask or things like that, um, first off, if you have a surplus of them, I would encourage you to donate them to whatever your local healthcare uh, provider is. Most of them are taking donations these days, and it's especially true for N95s. Um, but if you happen to have a couple on hand, they may be helpful. They would be more helpful, I think, than a cotton mask. Um, and again, kind of the guidance is changing a lot. So, uh, you know, you watch this next week and we might be saying something completely different, but that's where I stand on things right now. So 
uh, maybe a little bit wishy-washy, but uh, um, what's actually going to work, as John was asking, is a properly fitted, properly worn uh, N95 mask that you don't touch and you change out frequently. Now, of course, that is not entirely practical at this stage of the game. Um, so a lot of everything else is, is kind of lumped into that look safe camp unless you actually have an active infection. So uh, hopefully that was a sufficiently uh, pessimistic answer for everybody. Um, what is, Debbie asks, what is the proper way to wear a mask with oxygen? So that's an interesting question because, again, we get into that situation of you want to make sure that you have as good a seal as possible. But obviously, if you if you already are wearing a cannula, it's going to be very difficult to uh, mask that. So, again, I would caution against relying, especially with a, a cannula or other oxygen delivery device, um, I suppose if you have transtracheal, you're not going to get too much in the way of a, of, a, of a interference there or anything like that. But particularly with wearing a cannula, I would really caution people against relying upon a mask to protect themselves, uh, a mask alone. Um, again, hand washing, decontaminating spaces. Um, I saw, I haven't had a chance to read it, but I did see a, uh, an interesting article about um, uh, another one about gloves today that kind of reinforced what we talked about yesterday where most people are using them incorrectly. And if you're wearing a glove, then anytime you touch something, you really should change out the glove. And then you start getting into, uh, you're going to wear, go through 50 pair of gloves in the store. And that's kind of silly where you could really just be hand washing and all that stuff. Um, you know, so the proper way to wear a mask is basically, I don't know that I don't know that I would recommend it honestly. Um, uh, maybe maybe one of my RT fellows wants to chime in in the comments here if they have a, a different view. This is certainly uh, I certainly make no claim to uh, being the the be all end all expert or anything like that. Um, if uh, any of my RT buddies happen to be watching, feel free to weigh in there because. Uh, um, Always good to have a, a pro con debate too. So uh, I would definitely take the con side. I don't think it's really worth it all that much. Again, unless you're actually sick, in, in which case you're kind of protecting everybody else. Uh, and the proper way to wear a mask in that case would be to wear it over your cannula. Um, but in terms of this coronavirus, that would not be my recommendation. All right, so what else we got? I see we got a couple people joined in, and we've got, according to Facebook, we've got a few people still connecting. So um, what's on your mind? What kind of questions do we have getting through the end of a weird week here? Oh, here we go with Judy checking in on the main page. Need information about non-tuberculosis concerning my cough. Uh, more than what goes on with COPD, pulmonary doctor, not aware of this. Sorry, not related to issues this week. First of all, please do not at all apologize. These sessions this week, anytime, anytime you see a COPD navigator house call in the corner there, there's no topic. So there, this is totally free form, all that stuff. No need to, uh, to make any discussions or anything like that on a particular topic. So, um, Secondly, non-tuberculosis, I'm assuming we're talking about like non-tuberculosis mycobacteria or something along the lines of a bronchiectasis, that sort of thing, um, would be, I guess I would need to, I would need to know, um, exactly like what, what more information do you need? There is, a, there's. Off the top of my head, the, the general information I can give you um, is more along the lines of like bronchiectasis, which is kind of a similar path sort of ish. Um, it's fairly common with COPD bronchiectasis. We talked about that. Uh, you can uh, check out the archive on, on YouTube. Um, you've got um, a lot of times we talk about inflammation and stuff, making the airways smaller. In bronchiectasis, you have kind of floppier airways where it breaks down some of the tissue in there and you get these pockets of, of infection that kind of stay there all the time and then you generate all this mucus all the time and you have to cough it out. There are some studies um, that say that there's, it's a good rule of thumb that about half the people, particularly with chronic bronchitis type 
uh, on, on that end of the spectrum of COPD, uh, about half those folks may have some degree of bronchiectasis, which you can really only see on CT scan. So it's hard to pick out other than symptoms and things like that. Um, so when we're going along those lines, which can be more than COPD or kind of, you know, more than like the baseline COPD stuff, then we're starting to talk more about how do we clear out some of that mucus. And that would be things like uh, this gizmo here. We talked a little bit about um, uh, oscillatory positive expiratory pressure devices. Uh, this is one brand. Um, not uh, formally affiliated with them, although I do give them a big thank you uh, in the video down below there. Um, they sent us uh, at the Michigan Society for Respiratory Care. Uh, I would imagine it went out to other folks around the country. Uh, big thank you video. So I appreciate the Monahan Corporation for that. Uh, but otherwise not sponsored or, or anything like that. The way this thing works is you, you can't really see it super well, but inside this, this orifice, um, there's a resistance panel, and then if we take the top off here, we get this, you see this vibration vein here. And so what happens when we blow through this thing, that uh, the air pressure blows through there and makes that vein wobble back and forth and generates this vibration. And what the vibration does is it helps knock loose a lot of that accumulated mucus in the lung. So um, this is kind of a first line thing to help break up some of that stuff. Again, this is where we're starting to look at some of the chronic antibiotic therapy, the ongoing antibiotics, because when you have those pockets of infection, you start developing, you know, the, the it's, it's bacteria, all bacteria all the time. Um, and, you know, so we can try to kill some of that with some of the antibacterial agents that are out there. Um, a little bit more aggressive then we start getting into a thing called a therapy vest that does this but like 10,000 times as much it's got motors and stuff that vibrate up and down and all, all around your, your chest wall and all that stuff to, to break loose that mucus um, so I don't know if that's where we're going with the non-tuberculosis stuff or, or what um, or what uh, um, some of that is actually um, I'm, I'm chuckling a little bit. One of my good friends, uh, former colleague, Amanda, checking in. Appreciate you stopping by. Um, two comments. She said, uh, as far as the masks go, and I tend to agree with this, no seal, no deal. Uh, that's good. And then awesome technique with the, uh, the aerobica. And then I realized that my technique with my manual CPT was absolutely horrible because I was doing this as kind of a demonstration. If you're doing manual CPT on somebody, you should actually have cupped hands. So it's more of this kind of technique but it's very hard to do consistently and over a period of time, which is why we do things like the therapy vest and stuff like that. So uh, Judy, I don't know if that's answering your question or not exactly, but um, uh, you're mentioning concerning your cough and that sort of thing. So hopefully that's kind of along the, the same way. You might want to talk to your provider about this bronchiectasis stuff. And uh, if you haven't had a CT for a while, particularly one, that is specifically looking for bronchiectasis uh, might be something to discuss when uh, kind of the routine CT scans are, are back on the table. I don't know how it is uh, um, around your, your way, but uh, um, a lot of our routine labs and, and other testing is kind of on hold for a while. Um, here in Michigan, we're still kind of in the, the steep part of the curve, um, that exponential growth and uh, on the east side of the state um, is really rough. So uh, my thoughts go out to all my RT friends over on that side of the state. I'm anticipating that it's coming over to the west side here uh, sooner than we would hope, certainly. So, uh, All right, so let's take a look around again and see if we've got any other questions. Uh, hopefully my technique the second time around was a little bit better. Uh, let's see if any new COPD news has come out. In the meantime, make sure you're getting your uh, questions into the comment area. Questions, stories, complaints. You want to get something off your chest? You want to tell me that I'm funny looking or my nails are goofy or um, if that makes you feel better, then have at it. Let's roll. Um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, COPD news today, pretty much the same as yesterday. Um, actually, exactly the same as yesterday. We're still talking about some new meds coming down the pipeline. Who knows when they will be out? Um, 
Let's see. Let's just do a general. Oops. Let's first off learn how to spell. Then we'll do a general search here and see if anything else has popped up besides that one study. Um, all right. Now, here's interesting. Let's see what we've got going on here. This is kind of contrary to um, what we might think, but it's also the Newsweek. So this is not really a medical thing. And so I'm going to have to dig down a little bit deeper. Um, let's see what we've got to say. So the headline on this thing is COPD patients who have never smoked could be at greater risk of developing lung cancer, study suggests, which seems pretty much backwards. Um, of course, you know, we know that um, about 20 to 25 percent of folks diagnosed with COPD uh, have never smoked or have smoked you know, not enough to be at risk for any of that stuff. Um, so this was a paper. Okay, so we've got a link to a journal, an uh, actual journal, which is called Thorax, which is quite a good journal, um, except it seems to be the wrong link. So let's see. Uh, looks like they pasted the wrong link in there because I'm getting a thing from Slack. Let's see if that works. Well... So if they can't post the link properly, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, <laughs> and as somebody mentions in the comments, bad headline leaves the impression that smoking would be good for COPD patients. So um, this is kind of the issue that we see a lot in healthcare and science journalism. There's a rush to really kind of simplify um, a lot of terms and concepts and things like that. And a lot of the things that we talk about in a clinical sense don't always translate well. Like yesterday, we talked about the idea of mild coronavirus disease, COVID. Um, in relative terms, a lot of the times this minor thing is still like a really, really bad case of the flu. Uh, when we're talking about mild, we're talking about where you don't have to go to the hospital. Uh, but it's still, you know, in, in the civilian world, oftentimes we think of mild as just being, ah, it's just kind of this uh, um, bad cold or, you know, mild cold or something like that. So um try yeah so this link is just straight up broken and i'm not sure let's see if i search for thorax copd smoking And if I go for news, all right, so here is from a different article, a different magazine from a slightly more reliable source. Um, let's see if I can actually get the article up, get it right from the horse's mouth. So that, because like I said, a lot of the times when you run into, um, healthcare and science journalism and stuff, it tends to get a little bit oversimplified. So this study, um, cohort study, so this is kind of a, a longitudinal thing. They looked at 338,548 subjects, no history of lung cancer at baseline. This appears to have been over in Korea. Um, using information from their National Health Insurance Service National Sample Cohort, um, between 2002 and 2013, uh, men and women aged 40 to 84. Um, compared to participants without COPD, those who had COPD were older, more likely to be male. Smokers have a lower income, more com comorbidities. Basically, all the things that we generally accept, except uh, nowadays we know there or the trends have been women seem to be more affected by COPD than men. Um, the risk of disease in never smokers with COPD was higher than in ever smokers without COPD. Um, so if you have COPD, you have a higher risk than if you were a smoker but didn't have COPD. Okay. 
In conclusion, COPD was a strong independent risk factor for lung cancer incidence in never smokers. Furthermore, never smokers with COPD had a similar risk of lung cancer compared to ever smokers. Patients with COPD are at a higher risk of lung cancer, and future studies should evaluate whether COPD, COPD patients are candidates for lung cancer screening, irrespective of smoking status. So um, this study kind of seems like, on the surface, and again, I haven't really dived down into it or anything, but on the surface, it seems like kind of those well does studies. Um, if you have something wrong with your lungs, you're at higher risk for other stuff going wrong with your lungs. So um, it does seem to be a pretty significant difference. So never smokers with COPD had over 2.6 times the incidence. Okay, so if you were a never smoker with COPD, you had a significantly almost three times the chance to get lung cancer than never smokers without COPD. So that, again, makes sense. Um I don't know. I, I can't say I'm terribly impressed with this study so far. So not much going on there. Um, <laughs> uh, so not much going on there. I will jump back into some of the comments here. Uh, nails provided by my daughter, Emma, uh, using uh, Hollow Taco, um, an excellent uh, YouTuber, entertaining YouTuber um, out of Canada. Started with nail art, now does her own uh, nail company. So Oh, Canada. Hey, Alex. Uh, Alex, our clinical dietitian, checking in from uh, the Marshall area. Miss you guys, too. Hope things are going well over in that neck of the woods. Um, so, yeah, that's where we're at. We've got the, the nail update. We've got the uh, um, all that stuff out there. So uh, going back to some of the actual comments here to the business at hand. Uh, that is good. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, post the address for the device. So let me see if I can find some more information about our friend, the Aerobica specifically. Um, I don't know if they have a website or not. Sometimes you can get them. Um, sometimes you can get them through a physician's office. Sometimes you can get them through a pharmacy. Uh, they are technically a medical device, so they can be a little bit tough to get. So I'm going to drop that link in the uh, comments to the main video here. Um, and I'm also going to drop this phrase, oscillatory positive expiratory pressure. Oh, pep. And that way you can look at some other things that are out there and maybe get some other ideas. If you're not able to get specifically an aerobica, um, you might be able to find something that works in a similar fashion. There's the acapella. There's a couple other ones that are out there. Uh, so Bill uh, checks in. Uh, any good information on con common canister practice as supply is limited now? Uh, recommendations for CDC for treatment of COVID-19 positive or rule outs with MDI rather than SVN? Is there a safe way to administer common canister practice? As a matter of fact, yes, I, I believe that there is. I contend that there is. I think this is something that we probably should be doing in general. Uh, but as we've talked a couple of times, um, there there is currently an albuterol shortage, uh, albuterol inhaler shortage. Uh, most of the brands of albuterol, some of them are kind of coming in and out of stock um, or on a, a allocation um set up where you know some places are able to get them some places you know it's kind of a rationing kind of thing so this idea of common canister is you can have one inhaler um you know normally even a, a hospital dose of this thing still usually has like 80 puffs in it or something like that and so you do two puffs at a time maybe you have somebody who is on an as-needed regimen and um, they only need it once or twice during their stay. So maybe they get four puffs, maybe they get 10 puffs, uh, and then you throw this thing away. You can't send it home with them because you're not a pharmacy. Uh, you can't give it to the next person because it's icky, um, all that kind of stuff. So is it possible to do? Yes, absolutely. Because if you have a common canister, you can even just have this bit and leave although usually it comes as a package so i guess depending on how you get your hospital stuff but you leave this the valve holding chamber in the patient's room um, everybody just gets this this is usually pretty well valved um, this is also pretty well valved you can't really get backflow into the device um, so there are ways to um, 
clean it properly uh, and make it safe. There are places that have done it over and over again. Um, there's a lot of pushback oftentimes from infection control uh, departments and things like that because they don't see how it's feasible. But there is very little evidence to support that you do have that transfer back and forth. And I can also tell you that there are certain facilities um, I know that there are some in Michigan, I believe, I have to imagine there's some across the country that are kind of instituting this as their emergency practice right now because there are limited supplies of albuterol inhalers and because using giving it medication via nebulizer is frowned upon right now because it's what we call an aerosol generating process or aerosol generating procedure. By kind of definition, um, you have this aerosol that's floating around that if you have somebody who maybe is in the hospital for something else doesn't know they have this novel coronavirus um, now they're breathing out and they're blowing the it's attaching to all these aerosol particles and now it's going out into the room where it's infecting all the surfaces and potentially the clinicians in the room so and that is generally considered to be a bad idea so trying to do these inhalers more often which is leading to the shortage so um, the short answer is yes um, there is some good information out there. Yes, there are some clinical practice. Well, I shouldn't say they're clinical practice guidelines, but there are some, um, I believe there are some um, uh, sample uh, procedures out there. Um, I would certainly reach out to, if you happen to be a member of the AARC, I would imagine we can find some good resources through AARC Connect. Uh, that that uh, that site. If you're not, I would imagine if you can post um, in some of the f respiratory Facebook uh, groups that are out there, be prepared for a lot of people to poo-poo it and all that kind of stuff. But it's my contention that yes, there is a safe way. Yes, it can work. And yes, it can save a lot of money. Uh, so we're going to scroll back up a little bit here. Uh, I think that's the last one from the actual video. Yep. So let's see. Um, so Alex asks, um, my dad just called and asked why they can't put sulfur in CO CPAP machines to treat COVID. I explained to him this is a terrible idea and would likely be lethal. Um, yeah. Uh, if I, uh, if I had a chance to ask an RT opinion, I would. Here I am. Yes. That's why we're trying to do this stuff. Give people some extra insight here. Um, Sulfur. Uh, I, I, I don't know how, um, and I don't know why. Um, sulfur? I, I got nothing. <laughs> uh, I don't know how you would put sulfur in a CPAP machine, and I don't know why you would put sulfur in a CPAP machine. I, I can't think of any mechanism off the top of my head where sulfur would kill a virus. Um, Certainly not in a form that would be tolerable to humanity. Um, so I think that would be a poor idea. With all due respect to your dad. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would kind of like to know a little bit more context as to what, where he got the theory. Um, because maybe I could straighten up a thing or two. But um, short answer would be no. Um, also, thank you, Kyle, from checking in from Kentucky. Kyle, outstanding RT. Hope things are, are safe down in the area. Um, so Amanda again checks in with, uh, uh, we have gone to something like this with the common canister. It does, uh, and it bugs her. I uh, haven't been there since it changed, but the efficacy of the one-way valve bugs me. So, um, you know, that that's fair. That's fair. Um, this is, you know, clearly when you have one of these these uh, valves holding chambers and again I'll see if I can get it close enough to the camera where you can see this is not a sealed one-way valve certainly Let's see. so you can see that it, it's certainly not a seal um, at, 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 at rest I mean if you're if you're actually and you know, I can even blow through it, although a lot of it's kind of coming out the, the well. It's, I have to really, I will say, I really have to blow on this particular model uh, when it's actually closed and sealed properly. I have to really put some oomph to get past that, that duckbill. Now, 
again, that's not necessarily, we don't necessarily do things from infection control based on the oomph factor, but um, I, I, off the top of my head, I, I believe that the risk is low. And as I said, I, I, I do know that there have been some studies out there that say that this is fairly safe to do. Um, before I wrote a policy or something like that, I would want to do a little bit more research on it just to be safe. Um, but I, I do believe it can be done. And, you know, again, in, in a world where if we're, and again, this is also not a good idea, but if we're, if we're seriously contemplating putting multiple people on a ventilator and, and that sort of thing, um, you know, the risk would, would be, it, it gets to a relative point, I suppose. Um, so I see, uh, you're very welcome, uh, Alex. So, uh, here we go. Kyle checks in along with sulfuric acid, sulfur forms compounds such as sulfur dioxide, uh, sulfur, uh, hydrogen sulfide and sulfur dioxide, uh, used as a bleaching agent, all that stuff. Um, however, when combined with water, it forms sulfurous acid, which is a major component of acid rain. Okay, sure. Um, according to a quick Google check. All right, so thank you for checking on that. So I guess, you know, again, though, I, we run into the whole idea of, yeah, could be done, but I would not want to breathe that. I would not want, and I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to add that to anything. I mean, really, the only thing that should be going into a CPAP is uh, distilled water anyway, because whatever whatever is in there is likely to dry in some of the components or, or so on and so forth. And then you're going to inhale that. So that's why it's important to keep it clean and keep it pretty pristine um, at the risk of being the rhyme guy. Um, so I would, I, 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 I so I, I guess I, I appreciate Kyle checking in with, with the how it would work. So, cause it's been a while since chemistry, it all makes sense. Um, I still struggle with the why. <laughs> um, and I would definitely not recommend that. Um, I think, I mean, I, let me go back and look what the, are, are, Alex, if you're still with us, is he trying to prevent it? Because you mentioned to treat COVID. Um, that would definitely not be a great way to treat it. I mean, I, I guess, I mean, it wouldn't be a great way to do anything. So I guess it doesn't really matter that much, but. Um, if anything, it would potentially, well, and again, a lot of the issue we see, yes, there has been some issue with oxygenation and yes, CPAP can help with that, but we're also seeing, you know, a lot of other factors that with CPAP, you know, the, the machine itself just isn't going to be quite enough. Um, you know, we saw a big thing, uh, solve the, just trying to solve the world's problems. Well, uh, kudos for that. Kudos for the creativity, all that sort of thing. Um, this one I, I think is, is not, uh, not a successful attempt though. Um, going back a little bit, you know, we, we saw Elon Musk has a kind of an infamous thing now where he was talking about supplying ventilators and it appears to be home, um, by level CPAP machines, um, which can in some ways be looked at as a non-invasive ventilator. But the, the issues that we're seeing with people who are severe enough to go onto a ventilator cannot be handled by the home equipment. So um, there is, again, evolving research that's telling us some of the other less invasive therapies may be more effective than we thought. I was reading a quick glance article earlier today about um, what we call high flow nasal cannula, which we've been reluctant to use because that also spews out a lot of aerosol into the room, um, may be a little bit more effective than initially thought. And maybe we've been a little bit hasty on intubating a lot of people. Um, but again, the, 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 the science on a lot of this stuff in the, in the active, uh, the elephant in the room, I call it, um, is still evolving. So, but, um, sulfur is not going to be part of that. Um, so yeah, speaking of the world's problems, Elon Musk, uh, on him one step at a time, right? So, uh, I'm going to give it a couple more minutes here. See if we get any other questions to, to pile in here. Uh, I do appreciate, really appreciate everybody stopping by, particularly on a Friday. Uh, this has been a fun one. Been doing this all week. We'll likely be doing this again all next week. Um, 
going to take a little bit of a break over the weekend, I think. Uh, but this is certainly a good time to get some questions in uh, for next week. Next week, we're going to also be back with um, a actual Breathe TV episode, a little bit more formal one. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head what the topic is, but that will be the Wednesday show at 4 o'clock. I uh, plan to be doing these uh, house calls all next week, also at 4 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, so make sure you're getting your questions ready, formulated, all that stuff. You can get them to me uh, in any of these comments. Uh, I don't know if the watch party ones will stick around, but if you go to the video itself or if you check out our group on Facebook or our page, COPD Navigator, you can search for it and you bring up either one. Uh, COPD Navigator, the page has kind of a neon lighthouse effect to it. Uh, the group will say group. Um, so that's easy enough. Also check us out on YouTube. Um, as I mentioned, this is, uh, um, you know, we have, I have a, a routine channel over there. Plus I've got the, uh, um, now I can't see where I'm pointing cause I'm on a different screen now. So hopefully I didn't look too goofy. Got a new video, uh, video out there today. Appreciate everybody, um, checking that out. And if you see fit, please be sure to give me some feedback, uh, and share it with your friends and networks, trying to get some support from my fellow respiratory therapists out there in the front lines. Um, in uh, in ICUs, in emergency rooms, all those places. Uh, again, my heart and my thoughts go out to everybody who is uh, actively taking care of a lot of that stuff right now. Um, Amanda just kind of stumbled in here. Is this for RTs or patients or what? Pretty cool either way. Appreciate that. Um, my philosophy is that everybody should be on the same page. Um, so everybody should be speaking the same language. Uh, this was originally done more patient caregiver side, and then I took a break for a while, and I had a whole bunch of RTs say, hey, you're going to start doing those videos again um, because I learned a lot, and that kind of re-energized me. So um, this is a place where clinicians and um, people living with COPD and caregivers and everybody can kind of come together uh, and um, share stories. I, I have learned a, a tremendous amount. Um, I, I was actually just saying yesterday, I think I've learned more than I've taught in the uh, five or six years we've had this Navigator group. Um, and the nice thing about the Breathe TV shows is that also makes me do a little bit of research and expand into areas where I don't necessarily know a lot of stuff. So um, it's helped me out a lot to be a better therapist, I think. Um, so it, it's for everybody. It's for anybody with an interest in COPD. Uh, we frown upon sales, you know, sales pitches and all that kind of stuff. But anybody with information to share, story to tell is welcome. Uh, Maria, before we check out here, Maria, is there any lasting effect from COVID on the lungs? That is a very interesting question. Um, the answer, the, the, the real answer is it's too soon to tell. Uh, you know, the, while this is, We've had coronaviruses for a while. Uh, you know, a lot of other respiratory diseases are caused by coronaviruses, which is why I've been trying to be very careful about calling this specifically a novel coronavirus. I should, I suppose, be calling it SARS-CoV-2, which is the clinical name for it. But you say that, nobody knows what the heck you're talking about. So I um, end up going with the, uh, the common nomenclature, throwing out the $10 word there. Um, calling it the coronavirus or COVID-19, which again is technically the disease. Um, when we're talking about whatever we want to label it, uh, the elephant in the room, I've heard videos calling it Lord Voldemort, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's only really been known to be in people since November at the earliest. And again, that was over in Asia. Um, Maybe December, January started a little bit of spread before we really knew what we were looking at. So we're really only looking at three to maybe five, six months now of data. What we're seeing is that there is certainly some follow on effect for the very severe cases over the course of these months. I've seen numbers like 20 to 30 percent loss in lung function. Uh, which I'm guessing they're talking about FEV1 there. That's usually what people mean when they talk about percent lung function. Um, but we don't know how much of that is going to persist a year, two years, five years, 10 years. We don't know how much of that is eventually going to come back. Um, we can do some extrapolation. We know that the COVID-19 disease is very similar to what we call acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, uh, in many respects. And we know that most people who go through ARDS 
do not come out whole on the other side. So we can extrapolate that there's going to be some loss of lung function, whether that's going to look more like COPD or more like, say, a pulmonary fibrosis type of thing. That we're not sure of yet. We're not sure of the magnitude, the severity. There, there's still a lot of unknowns as to what the, the chronic thing is. It is my thought that um, if you have it severe enough to be one of the intensive care cases and go in the ventilator and all that stuff, uh, again, much like ARDS, I don't think you're going to come out 100% on the other side. How bad that's going to be, how long it takes to, excuse me, how long that takes to show up, completely unclear. Um, and that's going to be a, a source of a lot of research over the next decade or so. So um, keep an eye out for that, I guess. Uh, keep, keep, keep your eyes tuned or <laughs> keep your eyes peeled and stay tuned. Um, uh, talk about uh, like the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, uh, bronchiolitis obliterans. It, exactly. That's we don't know. We don't know what the um, uh, if anybody, uh, um, you know, we don't know what the final form is going to be to do like an anime uh, um, kind of thing. Uh, we don't know what the final form of this thing is going to look like. Um, and it's going to be a while before we know. So could call it con. We'll stick with uh, Voldemort, I think. But uh, as far as scarring, I, you know, I, I would have to imagine there's going to be some kind of scarring. Um, and so I, I would guess it's going to look a little bit more like a fibrosis or an interstitial thing um, rather than the traditional emphysema or, or something like that. But we just don't know yet. Um, just not bouncing back as quickly. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, are you, were you, did you, uh, you, you obviously welcome to not share that, but you mentioned not bouncing back. So the assumption there would be that you had a case of the COVID-19 at some point. So um, if that's true, I would I would suspect that there is not a, a bounce back. And, you know, there there's also a lot of debate. This was a, a, a very bad flu season, a relatively bad flu season. And some of the more conspiracy minded amongst the people that I know have said, you know, maybe this was among us for a while and took a while to bounce back. And, um, it, you know, it's a possibility. We don't we don't know some of that stuff, but um, I would definitely say, well, thank, thank you, Maria, for sharing your story, uh, confirming that. And I hope you are on the mend, you continue to be on the mend. Um, you know, again, we, we just we 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 don't know. We can't say for certainty where, how long this has been around. I would suspect that the, from everything that I have read from um, people who have shared their stories on Twitter and that sort of thing, this is something that takes a while to bounce back from. Um, how long that's going to be, you know, again, what the final form is going to look like, I don't have that answer, and I don't really think anybody does yet. Um, and what this means for chronic lung health, we're going to be watching that closely for probably – um, if, if the projections continue as they are, this is going to be a huge public health issue um, 20, 30 years down the road even. Um, you know, it's going to be much like people are studying the follow-on effects of the Flint water crisis now for, for many, many years and will continue to be doing that. Uh, this is going to be another one of those things. This is going to be something that we're going to keep an eye on for many years to come. So... All right, folks. Well, um, I think we've done our hour here. And I think um, unless anybody has a last minute question, um, this is the last call. Otherwise, we're going to call it a Friday night. We're going to let's see. We'll take a spin through a couple of other places where the video shows up. See if anybody's got some comments or questions or anything along those lines. Um, and we'll give it a minute for the last call to trickle through and get out through the buffer and everywhere else. Again, I do appreciate everybody spending a little bit of your Friday with me and also um, those of you who have been sticking around the whole week. Uh, be sure to check us out next week. Um, please, if you would be, uh, you know, of course, I, the, these things obviously have no charge or anything like that. The one thing I ask is that you help me get the word out about COPD. Um, selfishly, I hope that you're willing to do that by sharing our page, our channel on YouTube, our Twitter, um, the uh, Facebook group, all that sort of thing. Uh, trying to build this into uh, more of a movement so that once 
Uh, we can redirect some focus away from uh, Lord Voldemort here uh, that we can get people thinking about COPD again, that we can get people focused on the one of the leading causes of death in the U.S. and around the world and uh, continue fighting the good fight to get people uh, breathing easier. So if, if you would be so kind as to do that, I would greatly appreciate that. Give us a follow, give us a subscribe, give us all those things that the various media likes to talk about. Um, and come join us and share your story. We have a great community, uh, certainly not the biggest, but I believe it is one of the best. Uh, come check us out on Facebook. Um, hopefully get that, uh, the website running a little bit better, a little bit more smoothly, uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks here. Um, but that is what it is. And of course, if you have any suggestions for things to discuss, questions coming up, future Breed TV shows, future small videos that you'd like to see, um, I once upon a time had a dream of doing some instructional videos that uh, I might actually have time to get to uh, in the future now. Um, please let me know. Let me know how I can help you and how we can all help each other breathe a little bit easier. So um, with that, uh, I am going to go ahead and check out what's going on upstairs. Pizza night at uh, the old household tonight. So we've got some homemade pizza kits that the kids have been working on, and I am excited to go check that out. So I uh, hope everything is well where you are. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Breathe easy this weekend. Go out, get some walking in, get some activity, uh, get some positive news going, get some good vibes going. Um, and we will see you all next week. Uh, check us out Monday, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Until then, take care, everybody.